getting to the point where we're starting to be able to move designs from one side of the screen to the other. And it's, it had always frustrated me tremendously that we worked so hard to get the design on this side to look perfect, but we kind of abandoned everyone in taking the thing on this side and turning it into a physical artifact. And I think a lot about the conference today is really about making that membrane uh, permeable. So you can move things from here to the other side into the computer so you can compute on it. Once you can compute on it, you can want to fabricate it again and move it back. And a lot of what we're all going to talk about is, is that movement of ideas, you know, from your mind into, into the physical world and back again. So when I'm not being CEO, you can find me in one of my shops. This is, this is my shop. Uh, this is the metal shop. I'm busy building uh, shop furniture, which is just taking old machine castings and combining it with new stuff. Um, there's nothing like uh, building furniture with inch and a half Acme threads. I, I have not found a piece of furniture that would not benefit from an inch and a half Acme thread. <laughs> <laughs> and this is me in my wood shop along with my uh, woodworking robot, who now, unfortunately, I thought it was going to save me tremendous amounts of time. There, there, there's two funny parts of it that are somewhat ironic. One is when you have one of these big machines that you think is going to save you all this time. The first thing you do is you stand in front of it all day long, just watching it do work. <laughs> so you go from actually doing work to just standing there. And then when it's actually done, you have a ton of stuff left to sand. So I thought it was saving work and has created way more work for me than I ever imagined. So let me move on to really what the theme of the conference is, you know, with this background that you have of what I like to make, which is all about capturing, computing, and creating. And let me show you some of the capture stuff. And there's so many people today who have already done a great job, and there's many more over the next day and a half, who are described as active capture. But I, I chose three different examples that come from our customers and partners of doing interesting and representative work in terms of capture. So here's the first one. So this is a capture of Market Street in San Francisco. I mean, just, you know, from where we've come from, where we used to, you know, get thousands of points, tens of thousands of points. To be able to capture this, there's not a photograph in there. That is entirely a point cloud that's captured. And we're going to hear a little bit more around this project today. But I think it's kind of amazing. And in some ways, it starts speaking to this thing of we're going to be able to capture tremendous amounts of data. The real question is, what are we going to be able to do with all of this data? Here's a second one that I think is really exciting. So this, this, this is an avatar. So this is Jim Cameron making avatar. What people may not realize about this is every bit of motion for the movie was captured. So this is the first feature length movie in which every bit of motion for it was captured. And so it has this really different dynamic than what usually goes on in capture. Most of us are spending all of the time trying to capture the geometry and the topology of what we have. This one instead says, I already have the geometry and the topology. It's the 11 foot blue people. What I need to do is get realistic motion. And so what they were able to do was capture everything, whether it was a horse, whether it was a person, or in many cases, really low tech, like the flying um, spaceships, they actually made out of wireframes of hangers. And they just moved them around and again, took the motion of that and turned that into me. So a really interesting, High-tech, low-tech combination. Am I? Is this just me? <laughs> OK, we'll ignore that. Um, here's another example that you can see a lot of. This is a, a factory. So three different settings, one in, one in terms of media and entertainment, one in terms of factory, the other is the built environment. All really interesting places where there's a lot of data being captured. And we do have to figure out how to compute it. And if you look at the avatar one, that was the one that was most ready to plug and play in terms of they were able to turn it into a computable model. And I think that's really the important thing, is how do you take this data and be able to compute on it? Just visualizing it is interesting. It's not enough. The other thing about it that I think is particularly interesting is it starts leading to this idea of different kinds of representations of the information inside the computer. So in many cases, we've historically worked with analytical surfaces. But as we start gathering point clouds, it's going to become more realistic. 
and discrete forms of data in terms of point clouds or meshes are going to become more reasonable. And in the end, we will be able to do many of the things that people think are unimaginable, like drive CNC tools, even off data like this that's actually discretized as opposed to continuous data. Okay, so let's, let's just look at the compute. So here's, a, here's an example. This is a classic. I think Stuart talked about this morning. Uh, many people have fancy names for it. I still see it as reverse engineering. You have a part that already exists in the world. This is a new product that we just brought out called Fusion, cloud-based CAD system. What was important about it is that you can start taking in data that already exists in the world. And you can, you can bring in this data, and you can transform it through different data representations. So while people talk about it, Stuart did as well this morning, about these workflows, I actually think the thing that's getting in the way of these tools being really useful is that the workflows are really very much too painful. So while the point tools are good in and of themselves, uh, the place where the fidelity, the place where the pain enters the process is moving from one to the other. As he said, I moved it 11 times in an hour. My head hurts from the idea of moving between tools 11 times in an hour. And so we worked hard on trying to build a tool that said, this is built around the idea of I'm going to work together with other people. So two important considerations. One, I'm going to work with other people. If we're going to collaborate. I'm going to know what's going on. And the second thing is I can go all the way from ideation to fabrication in the tool. And we also here we show it runs on all kinds of Macs and PCs and things like that. Um, but that you can end up in the end taking this like, something that comes in as a point cloud and eventually be able to fabricate it in a CAM tool. And so we're really interested in trying to avoid these places where the data just kind of falls into a dark hole. And what bothers me most about it is the difficulty in going back and forth. And that idea of iteration seems so important to me in the way that you make things that you need to do iteration all the time. And, the, and when the tools prevent it, I think it prevents you from making the best things possible. Let me move on to one other thing that has me particularly interested. And this is this idea of generative design. And it's different, it's different than what we see going on in the world where we're going to capture something. This is a different idea in which it starts with the idea that computing is virtually free. And it's virtually infinite. And if you had all the computing in the world, how would you design and engineer things differently? And that's known as the starting point for what we were thinking here. And at first we said, let's just test exhaustively. And that certainly yielded some results. But then we said, what we really want to be doing, because in the world of CAD, you know, computer-aided design, I would say in the 30 years that CAD has existed, the computer has barely ever aided in the design of anything. Uh, it's, it's starting to... <laughs> It started 30 years ago, and we did 2D documentation. We agreed upon a convention, and I made a blueprint, and I transferred it to you. Today, we do the same thing with 3D models. We document our ideas. We do not design in these tools. And the idea is we need to reach the place where these tools actually help us. So here's this idea of generative design. So imagine we have something fills a space envelope, and there are two fluids in it, and they're going to pass by each other, and there's thermodynamic requirements about exchanging heat. And all we're going to talk is about a high level specification of what we want. And now we're going to let the computer, and remember, we believe that computing is virtually free. So we're going to run, let it run for hours, thousands of hours, tens of thousands of hours. And there's the heat exchanger that the computer designed. So it's, it's one of these interesting things. It makes a lot of designers, uh, I'd say, almost angry uh, that the idea that, you know, it's, but I look at it as it's just another one of the tools. It's another technique that we have that will start getting at it. What's interesting about this design and several others like it, it explores the space in a way that guarantees you a near optimal solution. And there are very few times, as a matter of fact, we did another one for, um, a part, of the, a part of the motorcycle, uh, an, electric, an electric motorcycle, we were working on the swing arm. 
and we ran it through the same algorithm, and the result that comes out looks almost identical to a dog or a cat pelvis, except it has a hole on one side. And we say to ourselves, this has to be a bug in the algorithm. It turns out, of course not. Unlike a dog or a cat, the loading on a swing arm on a motorcycle is asymmetrical because the chain is on one side. And so it was interesting because when I went back and I, you know, you go to the Google and you look at the images, and what, what the Google tells you is that all the swing arms have ever been designed for motorcycles, nobody ever picked up on this fact. So I think there are insights that we can learn and that we need to be a little less proud about letting computers start helping us design and engineer things better. Here's another example just like this. This is one, um, it's growing a structure. And this is for a hip cup. And the idea behind the hip cup was to make a structure in which the uh, foam is, has pores that are pseudo-random in size. And the reason is that it's demonstrably better in terms of having the bone grow into that if it is pseudo-random as opposed to a regular structure. The body recognizes that as weak bone and grows into it much better than if it's a regular structure. So we work, we work with a customer on being able to do this. And really, the interesting thing that comes up in stuff like this is because this will, will be different for everyone who gets one, all of a sudden you have to get the FDA not to approve a device, but the FDA has to approve an algorithm. And if you think it's hard getting uh, the FDA to approve devices, getting them to approve algorithms is really hard. OK, so let, let's just move on to the, you know, the next part, which is create. And one of the things we got interested in was 3D printing. And the, the genesis of it is really when you look at what we're doing with generative design. So if you think about it, why is Autodesk interested in 3D printing? It's only because those shapes that are coming out of generative design are really difficult to fabricate in any other way. And I think we're on the verge of getting to the place where we will start being able to truly use additive manufacturing to be manufacturing, to make real products that go into the world. This was our first attempt at a printer. This is just released. It's called the Ember. It, it's a re relatively small scale, but high resolution printer uh, that we're selling. The important thing about Ember uh, was that it has three ideas built into it. One is an open software platform called Spark that we want others in the industry to use and we're working with others to adopt. It's an open hardware in which we're publishing the design and people can take the design and riff on it. And they can take the design and build others or improve upon it, and we're hoping they do. And the third one, unlike other 3D printer manufacturers, we are encouraging people to experiment with materials. We want people to put their own materials in so that we go forward in materials. Open hardware, open software, open software, and open materials. Let me skip that and move on to some other things like 3D printing. Two things that I'm particularly interested in 3D printing these days, we're seeing a new generation of machines. This is called the Mark Forge, but there's a whole series of them in which they are now taking plastic parts and putting in filament. So you have fiber reinforced plastics. This one does Kevlar and carbon fiber. And all of a sudden, you're starting to turn those unusable plastic parts into truly manufactured goods. So that one's interesting. Second one, there's another company I visited again yesterday. They are now printing um, plastic parts at about 100 to 150 times the speed of the standard SLA or FDM printers. So for the first time, you can actually see the print taking place before your eyes. You know, so things that took 12 hours are taking six minutes. It's incredible when you're able to do that. So I think we really are on the verge of, verge of really important stuff where these things will no longer be prototypes, but they will be used in real production. Let me show you some other stuff I'm interested in digital fabrication. This is some work going on at the University of Stuttgart. This is Akamengis' work um, in which he's using uh, two highly coordinated industrial robots to do wet layup of things like carbon fiber. 
I just love the choreography of this. I'll just watch it for a second. And there's the architectural size structure that's digitally fabricated. So I think this is amazing. We're now getting to the place where we can start designing truly interesting things in the computer with its help and being able to fabricate them. Here's another technique I'm equally interested in. Um, again, for, for me, most of these things are not about being dogmatic. It's purely practical. I think there are huge advantages to additive manufacturing that I talked about, such as shape complexity being free, the efficiency of materials, but there's also the precision that you get surface finish, that you get things from subtractive. And so what I like about this is the combination of additive, additive and subtractive we can really get the benefits of both. So, how does this all come together? That's what we're here to talk about. It's the capture, compute, create. For me, the capture is the first part. It's really important. But if we can't get it into a computable form, it makes little sense. And I spent a lot of years in which we kind of abandoned people at that side of the screen with a computable model. What I'm most excited about is bringing it to the other side and being able to now fabricate these things. So just like Ethor said and the folks from Unique, here's an example of a story. We bring in scan data for a prosthetic device. This was done by our friends at Amped, a woman who had lost her leg in Afghanistan. That's the, that's the scan of it. She was an avid sports photographer, a nature photographer, and wanted to get back to being able to do that. And this, this is stuff where it's brought into fusion turned into an analytical surface. Here you can see the shield being actually built. And it'll go all the way through fabrication. Here's a little bit of analysis on it. So we can actually start to build digital prototypes, really understanding how this thing is going to perform. So I'll move it along a little bit here, but you get the point. And there's the, there's the, there's the finished product. So this is all being done in the cloud. This is a, this is a product that sells for uh, $25 a month. Um, and by the way, students, faculty, institutions around the world, it's free. Anyone who does this for hobby or nonprofit, it's also free. So for $25 a month, we're starting to get things where we can scan data in the world, bring it in, model it, compute upon it, analyze it, and fabricate it all in one place, and, and visualize it just like that. So I think that this is you know kind of the future of how we're going to make things. and. It always strikes me as odd as people are doing this amazing building of these things for the future that they're using 20-year-old tools to do it. And so I feel that our obligation at Autodesk as tool makers is to bring the latest, greatest tools and do our small part in bringing the industry forward by really making these tools available to everybody. And here it is available on a mobile device. And there she is, being able to go off-road once again and be able to do nature photography. Thanks very much. Wonderful introduction to Capture, Compute, Create. Next we have Bill Chrysler. Bill started Chrysler and Associates 33 years ago and is truly one of the leaders in fabrication. Um, wonderful projects, his bio speaks for itself. What you may not know is that Bill used to be a boat builder and a boat racer before building and fabricating great buildings and works of art. Yeah, our motto is anything with boats right now. <laughs> no better way to ruin a hobby than do it for a living. Um, at least in my case. Uh, so thank you all for coming. Thanks also to the sponsors and the exhibitors for being willing to roll a dice on something brand new and uh, show the kind of spirit that this whole sort of talk is about. 
and uh, thank you for coming and doing the same. Uh, my presentation is really about kind of my little company. We're up in Napa uh, now, anyway, and we've been in business for 33 years, as I said. And we started as a result of the company I was working for being sold and me not having a job. And since I never really interviewed for a job before, I knew that wasn't going to work. Nobody would ever hire me. So I had no choice but to start my own business. And I took what I knew about composites. And I took a stack of credit cards that I had that I managed to have a little bit of room on. And I took a little teeny bit of the company that I had, uh, that I worked for that I owned and, and bought the old woodworking tools and started a little business making composite products for reinforced plastics. And so time went by, and fairly quickly, not too long after we started in 1982, we got an inquiry from an architect to do a project with them in Japan. It was a, a theme park. And one of the things they wanted was a 33-foot tall version of a gas station attendant, uh, which I said, sure, no problem. I didn't have to do that. Uh, <laughs> Because I had a friend who was working at the Monterey Aquarium at the time that had built this big whale, and I watched how they did that. And, and it's simple. You just take the, uh, whoops, that jumped past where I wanted to be. You jump past the, uh, uh, there we are. Um, you take the, the little model, and you take it over to your bandsaw, and you saw it up into slices. And if you're careful, and you get the slices just right, and you get thin enough so that you get pretty good resolution, and then you take it over to the uh, other thing, which is the opaque projector. And you put the slice on the opaque projector, and you back up far enough so that the projection on the wall gets big enough so that it sort of matches the size that you want to make the gas station. I mean, that's all there is to it. Then you pin on the wall a piece of foam of the appropriate thickness, and you draw the shape, and then you saw it out, and saw, and you, there you go. You stack them up shape the edges and you've got a sculpture, except we didn't have a clue how to be sculptors. I mean, we, we're just kind of like boat builders. And so we thought, well, we got to get a lot of thin slices, right? I mean, you can't, you know, we got to get slices like an inch thick so we can just kind of connect the dots. The trouble with that is the bandsaw blade was so thick that it turned it into rubble. By the time all I ended up with a bunch of sawdust and some weird, strange-looking gnome that looks sort of <laughs> so, so we decided I got to figure this out. And I was thumbing through a sculpture magazine, and I ran across a, a picture of an ad for a little company that was down in Monterey that had invented this thing called uh, Cyberware Scanner. And they had used it to do uh, motion picture stuff. They had done the water tentacle in the movie The Abyss, using this to capture the face, facial features of the actor. And they were exploring other uses for their little machine. And they were thinking maybe sculptors could use this information. And so I found that while I was really looking for a place where I could buy a really thin bladed bandsaw. <laughs> <laughs> and my plan was, okay, so I talked to these guys, and they said, yeah, you don't have to cut it up. We'll just scan it, and we'll have all those cross-sections, and you're going to be a part if you want. And that would have been just perfect. So I said, great. I'm going to send you this model. You guys scan it. And then you take all those cross-sections, and you print them out on typing paper, so I can put them in my opaque projector, and I <laughs> put them up on the wall, and uh, and you know I had then and now I'm down to one inch thick slices. That I felt like we could probably figure out how to do. So um, let's see, to get back to where I wanted to be. Uh, so I uh, I did that, and um, and. He said, well, you know, that's about the dumbest idea <laughs> I've ever heard. He said, why don't you uh, use a CNC machine, and since all this information is digital, you can just cut out the slice with a CNC machine. Well, I have no idea what a CNC machine And I worked in my godfather's foundry when I was 13, so I thought I knew all there was to know about machines. I went to the machinist 
Handbook, which is a book about that thing. It was a couple thousand pages of fine print at the time. And I found one paragraph on CNC. And it was like, you know, this is going to happen someday. <laughs> <laughs> and, but the sign makers, the guys who were making signs, who were customers of ours at the time, were using these to cut out lettering. I called them. I said, could you cut them out? And they said, no, no. You can't cut out one-inch foam. You can only cut out vinyl. So sticky back vinyl for making letters. But anyway, we decided maybe we just better make our own. There's the 286 IBM PC with the AutoCAD light stack of cross sections. <laughs> um, so we went and we said, OK, well, let's see if we can make our own CNC machine, because I couldn't buy one. And I had a little bit of money left on my credit cards. And I set a budget of 16000 which was the profit on the gas station then, plus all the credit I had on my cards left. <laughs> and I discovered that there was a company called CompuMotor up in Rhodic Park. <coughs> they made these little uh, servo motors that they could use to control, you know, the computer could control the motion. And there was a company called Linear Industries, a catalog company. You could buy rails and stuff. And then, of course, there's Orchard Supply, which was our local hardware store. And with those three, now today, that's called lean manufacturing, you know, reducing the supply. <laughs> um, this is our first CNC machine. It's plywood. Uh, it has a, a Bosch die grinder as the cutting tool and a router bit to cut out the slices and an air cylinder raise and lower it. So it's really just a two-axis router with an up and down motion on the cutter. And for years, and there's the Cyberware laser scanner, for a long time, we made stuff out of one inch thick slices. I called it Petaluma stereolithography. <laughs> and there's the gas station attendant uh, leg materializing out of the foam. We figured out we needed to cut through the foam, but not all the way. Because once you did, where the hell was, you know? So we left the foam, the foam in the square. We used the edges of the square piece of foam as an indexer. We glued it all together, and then we broke off the excess scrap. And that, lo and behold, top comes a foot. Um, and there's the gas station man. And I was over there not too long ago. <laughs> We're actually, my wife said, you're not going to show the gas station. <laughs> I'm proud of the gas station. So, uh, so he's, he's doing fine over there in the mountains of Japan. Uh, and, you know, the fellow from, from the UK with the you know, um, milky sheep. We, this, we, we were in a dairy farm, so maybe there's some connection between them. <laughs> anyway, there's some more stack stuff. There's another thing we made that gives you a little idea of, you know, not too much standing needed. There's Miss Piggy. Uh, that's the uh, mannequin for Miss Piggy for the costume that Disney wanted. Uh, dinosaur. We did a lot of dinosaurs. Um, and then Haas Oldenburg, the rather well-known pop artist, came to us with a sculpture that he wanted to do. And he wanted us to make the patterns for the aluminum castings to make the tie. And he heard about our skin. So we said, well, we could do that, except that um, we need you to give us a model. And he said, well, you know, I've got a model. It's really what I want it to be, but it's, it's not thick enough. We can't get the stain. The engineers are telling me there's not enough room inside to put the stainless steel armature. So knowing a little bit about composites, I said, well, why don't we just do it out of composites and forget about the stainless steel armature. We'll use the skins as the structure. So we had a little finite element program that was fairly new at the time and a structural engineer that we worked with that did this kind of thing. And he modeled it and convinced the German government, uh, the code officials in Frankfurt, that it was going to work. And we set about starting to make this sculpture. And again, all out of one inch thick slices. Uh, there's the artist and his wife, Kosha, inspecting the collar. Uh, there's the piece getting ready to ship. And there's the piece in Frankfurt in front of the DG Bank building. Um, we took that idea to the next level, and we started machining. Instead of using the foam to stack up and make the object and cover it with fiberglass, it occurred to us, well, rather than use the foam part, let's use the scrap. We'll put them together, and that will be a mold. So we molded these pieces in those one-of-a-kind molds out of fiberglass. 
And this is a piece called The House Ball. It's a series of blankets wrapping up what's supposed to look like a bunch of your earthly possessions. And uh, that's in Petaluma. That's the finished part. And in the foreground, you see the little plaster model. Um, and uh, in the background is the finished piece before the final coating. And there it is in Berlin at Checkpoint Charlie. Uh, it's part of the uh, collection of the uh, American Embassy. Um, then Robert Graham came to us with a sculpture he wanted to carve out of stone. And of course we said, sure, no problem. <laughs> Give us the money. <laughs> and we, but this was too heavy to do any other way, and, and we couldn't. So we decided we needed to make a new machine. We needed a machine that would basically take a big heavy block and turn it around on a turntable, and maybe have a, an X and Y arm going up and down, and then what we got to do is figure out how to cut stone. We looked into all kinds of things and finally decided that a diamond-bladed chainsaw would do the job. So we looked into that, and sure enough, some guy came out and saw the, the curb out in front of the shop in half for us to show us how wonderful <laughs> it was. The only problem was these damn chainsaw blades cost a fortune, and we figured he gave us a little calculation on the number of chainsaw blades we'd need to do this job, and it was like twice the budget for the whole job. So forget that, we went back to the artist and we'll take the stone, grind it up into a powder, mix it with resin, and we'll cast it out of a cast stone. We'll need a female mold, so we need a male pattern from which to make a female mold, and that's what we, what we by then we'd already started making this stupid machine, and so we just carried on. The machine has basically got a tower crane bearing uh, with a plywood top on it, and it rotates around, and then next to it are these two giant steel columns in between of which there's an arm that goes in and out with the motorcycle chain guiding it up and down. That's the, the some people use ball screws. <coughs> use a motorcycle chain, works <laughs> uh, And then the, the cutting tool is just a, a piece of shaft log, a, you know, a dry shaft, uh, shaft material, hardened steel, basically turned out a little bit on the end. Epoxy, dip that into crushed uh, aggregate, and that becomes an abrasive, and that was the cutting tool. And uh, so, you know, it worked fine. And then we made uh, a female mold off that foam, took the foam out of the sandblaster, uh, and then cast the part. And that's down in San Jose, that's in this sort of central courtyard, of this, uh, right down in the middle. Um, a uh, converted milling machine, and then we also made a bigger two-axis machine, and we actually made it a three-axis machine. So we've got a four-foot Z-axis, which we could do more complicated shapes. This is this is a, a, a pattern for a mold for the like, cowling for the JLG, you know, those construction machines. Um, then we thought, well, you know, we can make it into a four-axis machine. We'll put a rotary axis on it. And then we can turn something. And so this is a pattern for a casting, a bronze casting for a sculpture uh, that is uh, in Central Park uh, West, Central Park East, at the north end of Central Park. It's the third of the four corners that has a sculpture. It's the Duke Ellington Memorial, uh, and it's by Robert Graham. And uh, we did the columns, and we did the statue of Duke, all using laser scanners and CNC machines. The trick we had was that we didn't care so much about super precision. If we could be within a millimeter or two, we could limit the accuracy of a good cabinet shop. There's an awful lot of there's a big market for the ability to do this kind of thing that close. And so because of that, we could get away with motorcycle chains, and power crane bearings, and eight motors, and Bosch die grinders. There's another machine. There's the first real machine we've actually bought that one. I think it's a five axis machine. Then things, you know, over the years get more complicated. Uh, that's the model of it. This is the rock formation itself. That was the casting in important place concrete from molds that were the negative of the scan data that were made out of foam and used as form liners for the casting. So uh, more stuff on and on. And uh, this is at the Denver Convention Center. This is called, uh, let's see what you mean, this is the sculpture. He's looking through the third 
story window of the convention center. We talked about this. This is in uh, this is up in Sacramento. This is at the airport up there. This is all aluminum, actually. This was cut out by a friend. Okay, great. Not a problem. I'm not trying to make anybody bad. Just want to make sure that things are as So there are people reporting in there? Are you going to shut them down? No, they are. They are no, on the left hand side. I'm sure I see where the people came from. Oh, fuck's sake. Okay, great. Thank you. So are you aware of that, Chris? Can you hear me? Chris, are you there? 